Our modern world is defined by convenience. From smartphones to cars, fashion to food, and it's becoming cheaper, smaller, and smarter than ever before. All made possible by the factory. We live a way of life that we simply could not live without the factory. Modern manufacturing fuels our consumption and gives us the means to wage wars on an unprecedented scale. But it has also allowed us to go further, faster. It has taken us to space. I think there's something quite marvelous watching people collaborate. This whir of activity moving in, in some synchronous motion, how does that happen? Revolutionary ideas come to life on the assembly line. The ever-evolving synchronous interaction of humans and machines that has made the modern world. A year of effort, grinding effort. In 1941, more factories have come into operation. More men and women have gone into the factory. The concentration of industrial life on work for the war has continued unceasing. Factories have given us the modern world. For better or worse, they define the way we live. In some cases, they also define the way we fight and die. In the past 100 years, we have waged a new type of war, one that is fought and won not just on the battlefield, and not only by soldiers. We often see the war as being fought at the front. Men, tanks, air power, or perhaps ships as being crucial. But actually these key parts of equipment, these don't exist without the factory. Factories feed war, and war feeds the industrial world. Weapons manufacturing today generates billions of dollars a year, much of it concentrated in the US. Two world wars fought on the front and on the factory floor gave rise to this new industry with their unmatched scale of manufacturing, man hours, and materials. Compared to large scale mass produced industries, processes where they minimize the stock, you don't always have that luxury. Modern weapons manufacturing may have begun out of the necessity of 20th century wars, but it has grown far past it. Today, one of the most prolific weapons is the firearm. It is estimated that there are over one billion guns in the world. This figure encompasses revolvers, self-loading pistols, rifles, carbines, assault rifles, and sub and light machine guns. Of this figure, 85% are owned by civilians. The country with the highest rate of gun ownership, the United States of America. The U.S. represents around 4% of the world's population, but owns 40% of the world's guns. These astronomical figures wouldn't be possible without the industrialization of weapons manufacturing. The factory helped us make more guns more easily. War made us more ingenious at designing them. In the early years of the 20th century, the technologies of the past were dwindling in the face of a new power, automation. Nowhere was this change more apparent than in the birth of modern machine guns. Test of the Army's giant machine gun, a jumbo gun of 50 calibers, the newest and most effective threat to airplanes and to tanks. Manual machine guns emerged in the wars of the 19th century designed to decrease the manpower needed to fight. The most infamous among them was the Gatling gun, but it was dwarfed by a newer invention, the world's first automatic machine gun. Created by British-American Hiram Maxim, it would quickly become a symbol of European imperialism. Hiram Maxim is the inventor in the United States of the first really effective modern machine gun, more effective than the old Gatling that was used at the time of the American Civil War. The effectiveness of the Maxim machine gun came from two functions of its design. First, it harnessed the power of the gun's recoil to eject the empty cartridge and load the next bullet. Second, it was water-cooled, which allowed it to fire for longer without overheating. The Maxim machine gun was sort of the quintessential rapid-fire, gas-operated machine gun. 
It was used towards the, the tail end of the 19th century into the 20th century. But when Vickers bought the Maxim factory in 1896, it gave the opportunity for Vickers to improve on the design that Maxim had developed. From 1912 onwards, the Vickers heavy machine gun becomes the standard British Army infantry weapon. It's a heavy system. It's not something some, a, a single man can carry. And it needs a team of about six or eight men to operate. But once, once it's operating and up and running, it can fire enormous numbers of rounds per minute. It has a reputation as being an extremely reliable weapon in all sorts of weather conditions. Then in 1914, the world went to war. By the time war broke out, 12,000 Vickers machine guns had been produced. Over the war years, that figure rose to 100,000. The proliferation of the Vickers and the devastation it wrought in World War I gave rise to the nickname the Machine Gun War. A testament to the reliability and the resilience of the Vickers machine gun, the British company of the machine gun corps literally fired just short of a million rounds over a 12-hour period with 10 Vickers machine guns without any clogging or jamming. That is a remarkable feat to achieve in what was an early 20th century development of firepower. It was this reliability and power that kept it in use for over half a century and through multiple wars. Use of the automatic machine gun in World War I also redefined military tactics. Machine gunnery became an area of expertise, the responsibility of specialist corps. It was used by infantry, on armored vehicles, on board ships, and as an aircraft gun. Some of the Federal Army's equipment is distinctly vintage, like these Vickers machine guns introduced into the British Army in 1916. When it was finally retired from British military service in 1968, it had been in operation around the world, across six decades, and operated by 50 different nations. The Vickers was one of a series of classic guns designed in the early years of the century developed or used for the first time during World War I, only to remain the pinnacle of weapons engineering for decades to follow. If you take a look at the First World War guns, some of those were extensively used. The Vickers machine gun was, was still being used in the Second World War. The Browning automatic rifle, which was developed towards the tail end of the First World War, was even still being used in the Vietnam conflict. And the reason for that is that the guns themselves are relatively simple devices. Once the engineers, the scientists had cracked this gas-operated mechanism where we actually recycle some of the propellant gases, use the, the recycling and reloading of, of the weapon, guns would only get better in terms of the material science and, and the steels that were, were being used. There is always room for improvement. Guns that were lighter, easier to use, more reliable. From the aftermath of World War II emerged one of the most influential rifles ever invented. And we've tested it here. When you fire it full automatic for a sustained period of time, you can't touch this weapon any place except right here and you have difficulty after sustained heavy rate of fire. When the AK-47 automatic rifle was revealed to the world in 1947, it was unlike any other weapon. Dismissed by the West before they understood what it would do, it was not an elegant invention. It didn't have the precision and range or power of other rifles, but it was cheap, easy to use, and incredibly reliable. It not only looked like the workhorse of the weapon sector, it behaved like it too. The beauty of the AK-47 was its simplicity. It'd probably be prudent to say that a lot of modern designers of assault rifles have always looked back at the AK-47 as a way to make a modern assault rifle. It was reliable, it was functional, it was compact. And they say that even a child could disassemble it. The reliability of the AK-47 came from its unusual design. It used a gas system to capture some of the energy expelled when the propellant burns to fire a bullet. It then uses this energy to expel the spent cartridge and load a new bullet. 
the components of the gun are loosely fitted. This means it will keep working through grit and mud, meaning it almost always works. The curved magazine is one of the AK-47's most famous features. Its shape and reinforced metal lip is why it rarely jams while firing. The other relatively unique feature of the AK-47 was the fact that it had a chrome-plated barrel. It makes it more resilient when you fire the projectile, and it's less susceptible to hydrogen embrittlement, which is a common failure mechanism that we find in steels. Because chromium is a material that is able to deal with high temperatures, and let's bear in mind that the flame temperature of a propellant would be something like 2,000 degrees centigrade. And so you need a material in the chamber and at the barrel that's able to, to deal with that high temperature. The rise of the AK-47 was owed in part to its function, but also to the massive push of state-led manufacturing. During the 1950s, the Soviets sent out the AK-47 to communist nations. By the 1960s, it was being churned out of factories across the Eastern Bloc. It soon became the weapon of choice for armies, guerrilla fighters, and gangsters. Within 25 years of its invention, the AK-47 was the most common weapon on Earth. Now, it is estimated that 100 million AK-47s have been manufactured, and manufacturing is still going strong. The Kalishnikov company opened factories in Pennsylvania and Florida in recent years. The AK-47 may be the world's deadliest weapon, estimated to have killed more people than any other. But that hasn't stopped manufacturers from seeking to iterate and improve on the design and manufacturing of current weapons, seeking scale and materials that will improve performance and cost less to produce. Uh, when we look at modern weapon systems, there is this drive to replace the brass cartridge material with something that is cheaper, that is lighter weight, and has no effect on the performance of the weapon system. Brass is actually quite an expensive product because of its copper content. It's a 70% copper, 30% zinc alloy, and that makes it a rather expensive material to use Furthermore, copper is a relatively heavy element. Copper has a density of about 8,900 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you take a, a cubic meter of volume and you fill that with copper, that would weigh 8.9 ton. In the US, what they're looking to do is to increase the caliber of the projectile from a 5.56 millimeter caliber to a 6.8 millimeter projectile. And furthermore, they're looking at replacing the brass cartridge material with something which is a polymer-based cartridge which is consumed uh, during the propellant burn phase. Polymer cartridges for ammunition reduce the weight by up to 40%. This is a significant reduction for military use when that ammunition has to be carried by a soldier or shipped in massive volumes overseas. Current brass cartridges also conduct heat, spreading it into the gun's chamber. Polymer is a heat inductor, which means it contains the heat and drives it out through the barrel of the gun. This keeps the gun operational for longer, particularly for high-volume automatic weapons. As guns get more powerful and more ingenious in their design, the demand for ways to protect the human body keeps pace. Warfare has been changing in the sense that it's been more technology-driven we are finding, particularly in the West, there is much more political fallout if there is a death of a soldier. So there is a requirement for better protection, better technology, more resilient technology that's being used on the soldier. A solution to this problem would emerge from the most unlikely origin. Historic demonstration of man's latest contribution to longer life. It really works too. In 1965, Stephanie Kwolek was a chemist working for DuPont Chemicals. She was working on creating a fiber strong enough to replace steel wires used in car tires at the time, to make them lighter and therefore more fuel efficient. 
the threat of a fuel shortage was already looming in corporate America. The challenge was to find a solution that could be spun into fiber at a low enough temperature that it could be strong enough for use. What she discovered was not what they planned. A chemistry experiment gone wrong that created a miracle fiber. Ms. Kolick discovered a fiber that was at high tenacity, high strength, stronger than steel. If exposed to the right conditions, the molecules in Kevlar will bond end to end, parallel to the length of the fiber, forming strong bonds between the molecules. This makes it five times stronger than steel of the same weight, and it's also lighter than fiberglass. It can also handle high temperatures. Kevlar is famous for being used in, in body armor. The reason for that is that the fiber itself has this lovely flexibility about it. Kevlar, what it's able to do is to work like a net and capture the bullet as it's starting to penetrate the material. And given the fact that it's also stronger than steel, it's able to provide that sort of resilience. Kevlar is a, a functional and fabulous material for, for protection purposes. Kevlar has been used not only for protective purposes in products like bulletproof vests, body armor, and armored vehicles. Among its countless uses, it reinforced the landing cushions on the Mars rover and protected the exterior of the space shuttle. It lines jet engines on planes. It's in brake pads and engine belts on cars. Kevlar cables are worked into light suspension bridges and it is even used to create more durable and flexible fiber optic cables. The seeds of this weapon's development and the evolution of tactics was planted in the first half of the 20th century. In the rapid leaps of industrialization and widespread manufacturing necessitated by two world wars. Speed the work, it's a national necessity. The country must produce more in a shorter space of time if there is to be a chance of coming through our difficulty. First World War comes at the end of several decades of massive industrial growth in Western Europe and spreading to the continental countries. By 1914, France, Britain, Germany, Russia all have big iron and steel industries. And they also have very large engineering industries and diversified engineering industries so that they could adapt quite quickly to producing new weapon systems. In previous wars, troops had had to retreat into the barracks for the winter. In the First World War, the combat is continuous and it's industrialization that makes that possible. The First World War posed a whole new set of challenges and opportunities for industrialization and mass production. When war broke out in 1914, each side was trying to gain the advantage through technical innovation. Armies were already dealing with relatively new weaponry, like rifles, artillery, and machine guns, but they wanted to harness the factory too. Factories were soon pumping out standardized weapons, including guns and bullets. They also mass-produced supplies such as uniforms, boots, and tents for soldiers. Production of heavy guns was ramped up, making machine guns and artillery far more prolific on the front. In one campaign, the U.S. fired 40,000 tons of shells a day. Thanks to factory production, the British Empire alone was producing 50 million shells a year. By the end of the war, the British Army had fired over 170 million shells. Factories in France were even more productive. Between 1914 and 1916, they increased output of 75 millimeter shells from 4,000 to 151,000 a day. This was a technological war on a scale never seen before, and the casualties reflected it. Estimated at over 8 million soldiers and over 6 million civilians. It was the war to end all wars. But in reality, another war was coming. One that would dwarf the mass production and industrialized warfare of World War I. The debt we owe to factory workers is tremendous. Men and women undertook the vital business of making the tools to finish the job. Britain must be superior in arms and equipment, on land, on sea, and in the air. That was the workers' resolution 
and how magnificently they fulfilled it. In the run-up to the Second World War in the 1930s, many countries, including the UK and France, are expecting another long, heavily industrialized war and are making preparations to bring in industry and co-opt it once again for the war effort. So as part of their economic preparations for the war, industry has ramped up across all the great powers in the world over the 1930s. In the case of Great Britain, for instance, in 1935, we get the development of the shadow scheme, where they build what are known as shadow factories to increase their industrial production. They're not referred to as shadow factories as some kind of secrecy. In fact, this simply refers to the fact that alongside a normal factory producing its normal produce, you will get a sort of an annex extra factory that works specifically for production of war material, tanks, aircraft, anti-aircraft guns, other artillery, munitions, equipment, all these sorts of things. And they'll be linked onto, say, what was a standard factory producing cars or civilian aircraft. The machines of peace removed, those of war built and installed. Men who had made automobiles learned to make tanks and planes. Men who had repaired watches now made precision flight instruments. British manufacturers of luxury cars like Rolls-Royce, Daimler, and Morris secretly began producing aero engines, planes, tanks, armored cars, and soldiers' supplies like helmets. And around one-fifth of their workforce were women. One of the best-known shadow factories that's created in the late 1930s is Castle Bromwich in, in the West Midlands. And Castle Bromwich is designed as an aircraft production factory and it's designed to produce the newest of the British fighter aircraft, the Spitfire. And the idea being this factory created in the late 30s will produce a thousand Spitfires by 1940. Now, ultimately, they don't actually achieve that goal in 1940, but what they do achieve as part of this broader network is, is Castle Bromwich pushes towards the ability for actually Britain to, come 1940, be outproducing Germany in terms of aircraft by about 30%. Britain was preparing for the kind of war they had lived through only 20 years earlier. The Ministry of Munitions is the direct inspiration for the Ministry of Aircraft Production that's set up in Britain in 1940 in the Second World War. Winston Churchill had been Minister of Munitions in the First World War. A large number of the people who hold key positions of influence in the Allied powers in the Second World War actually remembered the industrial mobilization of the First World War. There is another side to this. Hitler himself did not want that kind of war, and he's looking for something which will be short, sharp shocks, defeat the enemy quickly, blitzkrieg warfare as we would now call it, rather than a massive long-term industrialized struggle. So yes, the Germans are quick to develop aircraft and tanks as part of their new war fighting process. But interesting, the German economy is actually at a much lower level of war production until about 1941. There are problems in, in Germany with a diffusion of, of different types of things they're trying to build. That causes problems in terms of the quantity that is ultimately produced. At one point in Germany, there are 425 different types of aircraft under production. By contrast, the Soviet Union, after the German invasion, concentrates on five different types. A long industrialized war would need access to massive quantities of raw materials, something Germany lacked access to. The countries that become the main Axis powers, uh, Germany, Italy, Japan, all have one linking theme in terms of their preparations for war, and that is that they are starved of key raw materials. Oil, key iron ores, things that they can't produce sufficient quantities of domestically. Therefore, their approach to the war, both as a strategy to defeat the Allies and as an economic strategy, is for quick, sort of lightning victories over the Allied powers, because that's really all that they can afford to do. The reality was another drawn-out war that spanned years and drew in nations from around the world a conflict that would demand a new phase of industrialization and mass production on an unprecedented scale.
Though the Soviets suffered big losses in heavy war industries when Germany overran the Ukraine, more than a thousand miles further east, back in the Urals, the production of steel has been going on at an accelerated pace. This plant, the largest single development in the Ural district, has produced nearly a third of the Soviet's output of iron ore, perhaps more than a quarter of its steel. For the Soviet Union, industrialization and factory expansion had long been on the agenda. As part of the Soviet Union's increased industrialization, they make efforts to build entire new factories, kind of almost factory cities for the purpose of production of war material, often out in very obscure places. A good example is the Magnitogorsk complex out near the Ural Mountains. Not the most accessible of places, but a gigantic plant purely for the production of, of key materials for war production. Some factories were built for war manufacturing. Others were retooled in response to the growing needs of World War II. One of the most famous was the Stalingrad Tractor Factory. Originally designed by Henry Ford's architect, Albert Kahn, the factory could produce as many as 144 tractors a day. In its life, it manufactured over 2.5 million tractors. During the war, it mass-produced the infamous T-34 tank. The T-34 was a first of its kind and a key weapon in the Soviet arsenal against the Germans. More guns, more tanks, cries the Red Army. And the factories answer with more guns, more tanks. These workers don't stop even for air raid alarms. Every minute counts. The T-34 was the first mass-produced main battle tank, which actually employed sloped armor. There were tanks before that had used the sloped armor, but the T-34, there was a deliberate and intentional use of oblique armor. Now, the advantage of oblique armor, it serves a twofold purpose. The first is that it's able to cause the projectile to ricochet at high angles of obliquity, and secondly, increases the line of sight through which the projectile has to penetrate to reach inside the tank. And so there are two principal advantages to uh, oblique armor. When the German army invaded Stalingrad in 1942, the factory was the site of intense fighting, targeted for its important role in Soviet war production. Stalingrad plant continued to produce tanks until the war itself literally surrounded the factory in the Great Battle of Stalingrad. And finally, in midst of the battle, the Germans conquered the factory, and, and that was the end of it. A lot of the workers, though, by then had been sent east with some of the equipment where they resumed production in other plants way, way farther east. But it was in the middle of making war material as the battle was raging around it. Production continued until the last possible moment. By the time the battle was done, the factory was largely destroyed, but the industry of war marched on. Americans are preparing with all possible speed to take their places on the battlefronts. Workers in the mills and the mines are laboring long hours under great pressure to turn out the weapons the equipment without which the war cannot be won. When World War II broke out in 1939, not every country was ready to meet the inevitable demands on manufacturing. American industry wasn't prepared at all. They had been talking about mobilization for two years, but Congress wouldn't move off dead center to really make the moves necessary to arm the US. And when the Germans invaded the lowlands in May of 1940, and overwhelmed the armies of France, England, Belgium, and Holland, it was a wake-up call for America. As the German army was cutting a swath across Western Europe, U.S. President Roosevelt announced to the American people a plan to manufacture 50,000 new combat planes in the next 12 months. This ambitious figure represented more planes than had been produced in the U.S in the entire history of flight. George Marshall, who was chief of staff of the Army, came to Roosevelt and said, the way we've been doing things does not work. You're going to have to turn to the industrialist to get the mobilization going. So he called one of his top aides, a Wall Street financier named Bernard Baruch. And Baruch said, well, here are the top three industrial guys in the US right now. Number one is Bill Knudsen of General Motors. 
Number two is Bill Knudsen of General Motors, and everybody can figure out who number three was. Bill Knudsen, a Danish immigrant who came to this country with $20 in his pocket. He knew everybody in the industry. He knew manufacturing. And he came down to Washington, and he said to Roosevelt, this country has been very good to me. I want to pay it back. And Roosevelt hired him as a dollar a year man to oversee the mobilization of U.S. industry. The U.S. government turned to one of their most successful manufacturing sectors, the car industry. They had led the way in establishing efficient assembly lines and churning out large volumes of precision machinery. Everything turned to war production, and it was seemingly overnight that the plants were converted, lines were emptied out, retooled, and went to manufacturing war goods. Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, the main motor industry producers in, in America. In 1941, prior to America going to war, they produced about three and a half million cars in one year. The following war years, they never produced more than 140. And the reason is because they've cut down on that capacity and used it for war production. Building the first four-engine bomber was a great gamble. No one would have thought that this maze of metal taking shape in the Boeing plant was to become one of the major weapons to fight for freedom a few years later. The automotive industry was the heart and soul of manufacturing in the U.S. They had perfected mass production far beyond anybody else in the world. And Knudsen knew this. And Knudsen started to look at how airplanes were being built. And they were being built like prototypes. There was no mass production, particularly of the four-engine bombers. And he knew that the auto companies could solve the problems. The automotive industry was the best equipped to take over production on such short notice. They had the capabilities, they had the knowledge for manufacturing, for high volume, that really there was no other industry that could to do that kind of thing. Plane manufacturing was a new direction with a whole new set of problems, but they rose to the challenge. So during the war, we see particularly impressive industrial achievement by the various factories of the different nations involved in the conflict. The most famous example, perhaps, is in the United States with the Willow Run Complex, which is dedicated to production of a particularly famous type of bomber aircraft, the B-24 Liberator. Willow Run, world's largest bomber plant. At this factory near Ypsilanti, Michigan, government-owned and run by the Ford Motor Company, B-24 Liberators roll off assembly lines. For the first time, Ford's mass production technique is applied to making bombers. Consolidated Aircraft designed the B-24 Liberator in 1939. At the time, it was the largest, most complex plane ever designed. Consolidated didn't have the necessary resources or production processes in place to mass produce this behemoth on the scale that Roosevelt required. So the U.S. government turned to the car manufacturing industry. By the 1940s, car producers like Ford had well-established assembly line processes designed to pump out a high volume of precision engineered parts put together exactly the same way each time. Jimmy Doolittle, in December of 1940, he approached Ford Motor Company and said, we'd like you to look at building the B-24 bomber. Henry Ford, fearing his company might be taken over by the government, said, yes, we'll do it. So in January, Charles Sorensen, vice president of manufacturing of Ford Motor Company, a real manufacturing genius, went out to San Diego to watch how B-24s were being built. And for a production guy, it was a complete horror show. They were building aluminum airplanes outdoors on steel fixtures. Holes drilled at nine didn't match at 10. To line up the engine for the centerline thrust, they had a pickup truck with pallets in the back and a surveyor's transit. So he went back to the Coronado Hotel and he took his notes from the day and he took his 35 years of manufacturing experience and he started doing assemblies, sub-assemblies, major assemblies, final assemblies, and four in the morning, on the back of placemats, in pencil, he sketched a layout 
of a bomber factory that would build a B-24 bomber an hour. In April 1941, Sorensen began construction on Ford's Willow Run factory near Detroit. The factory took 38 tons of structural steel, 5 million bricks, 6 months, and $65 million to build. Designer Albert Kahn, who was the architect of Ford's famous River Rouge factory, wanted to make the most enormous room in the history of man. When it reached peak operational levels in mid-1944, it was pumping out a plane an hour. Well, the factory starting at the west end was strictly manufacturing. Then the parts flowed around two parallel lines that manufactured the major components of the airplane. And halfway through the factory, they came to the final assembly lines where all the parts came together. And from the time they stamped the first part until the airplane flew away was about 25 days. But the real miracle was five days after they put the wing on the assembly line, that airplane was a flyable airplane in five days. They had 90 B-24s under assembly at any one time. It was an impressive factory for a groundbreaking plane. But adapting car production techniques to make planes was not without its problems. Cars at that time had around 15,000 parts. The B-24 had 450,000 parts and 360,000 rivets in 550 sizes. It was 67 feet long and weighed 18 tons. Some thought it impossible to apply Ford's assembly line approach to mass produce a plane that size. No matter how clever Sorensen's designs for the production line were, they would initially be hampered by the deeply embedded inefficiencies of plane manufacturing. They went to Consolidate and said, let me have your blueprints so I can start designing tooling. And Consolidate had very few blueprints. They were still working like a prototype. They had templates, shapes, and drawings. Well, Ford's used to designing tooling to knock out identical parts with a two ten thousandths of an inch tolerance. So Ford had to send 240 draftsmen and engineers to San Diego. They worked three eight-hour shifts a day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They produced five miles of engineering drawings a day. One third of these were obsolete by the time they got to Detroit because the Army and Consolidated were changing the airplane so rapidly that they just couldn't keep up. This delayed Ford about six months. And of course, the public expected great things out of Willow Run, and because they weren't producing bombers, it was renamed Will It Run. There's one thing that stood out, and that was that the quality of the work has still been kept up, and I'm sure the quantity will follow. Initial efforts to use Ford methods to make planes were very frustrating. There was a lot of conflict as the army and, and, and the government and even the public began saying, you know, where are the planes? All in all, it, it wasn't as easy as its advocates had anticipated. The solution to this problem would be a combination of standardization and scale, the two pillars of effective mass production. And they came up with the block concept. We will build 400 B-24 bombers or 600, whatever you want, and you can't change anything on that airplane in that 600 airplane run. If you want to change something, we'll start designing the next block. And this not only sped up manufacturing, but now every B-24 had a parts manual and a maintenance manual that matched its manufacturing. This is a B-24J Block 25 FO. And it was on the plate identifying the airplane, and the mechanic go, oh, I know how that airplane works. Aside from Ford, there were three major plane manufacturers making B-24s, Consolidated Aircraft, North American Aviation, and Douglas Aircraft. Over a two and a half year production run, Ford's Willow Run factory manufactured more B-24 Liberators than any other factory. They almost matched the total production of every other factory combined. Ford produced 8,645 B-24 Liberators, compared to the 9,808 manufactured at all other factories. This level of production was repeated across nations and products. 
It was a two-front war, the battlefronts and the industrial front at home. And the ability of the United States to produce ships and planes and tanks and trucks and guns, unprecedented scale, was central to the ability of the United States and its allies, which we supplied with a lot of this equipment, to win the war. It is the industrial capacity and the utilization of factories that is able to push the Allied powers towards victory. They grind the Axis powers down in a way that the Axis powers are simply not able to cope with. The massive scale and all-consuming needs of industrialization posed another problem. Civilian workers were turning to the armed forces at the same time as the home front factories needed more workers. It was a problem of both world wars, one that would be solved by women. As the demand for men was as limitless as global boundaries, this punch press stalwart was but one of thousands needed at the front. And that's where he is right now, released with others by American women workers. During World War II, there was a demand for a lot of material. The Americans supplied the British, supplied the French, supplied even the Russians with gear, weapons, ammunition, and all things needed to fight against the evil Germans. Production had to be increased. But the problem was all the engineers and technicians, people from the factory, it were usually males, and they were now in Europe or Asia fighting the war. So they were lacking staff, they had labor shortages. Getting workers during the war was a huge problem because 12 million American men go off to fight. One of the things you have happen is the dropping of discriminatory bars that kept other people out of the workforce. So many women moved into jobs that had previously been restricted to men. It wasn't an entirely new idea. Women had already worked in the munitions factories of World War I. One of the key things that makes the armaments effort, production effort possible in the First World War is an enormous broadening of the traditional skilled engineering, manufacturing labor force. This partly means using things like colonial labor, actually. The thing that's most traumatic to many people at the time was the movement of women into the munitions workforce. Typically doing less skilled occupations at the beginning, like filling shells, pouring in the liquid that goes into the shell to make the explosive. But by the later stages of the war, women are doing highly skilled occupation. In the UK, by the end of World War I, there were over 1.5 million women working in munitions factories. But this figure was completely outdone by the volume of working women in World War II. In the US, it is estimated that almost 6 million women were working in civilian jobs during the war. These were in factories, construction, transport, agriculture, and office work. There were also 350,000 women in the US Armed Forces. Similar numbers of women were moving into war work in Britain, too. For somewhere like Great Britain, what we see is Britain is the only democracy to introduce a conscription for women during the war. They conscript lots of women, particularly into things like medical services, but also to work in industry. They work in the factories in a similar way that they had done in the First World War, but they're allowed to take on more skilled roles in the Second World Wars. In that sense, it is a, a small sort of progressive step in, in the sense of being able to, to work as a woman in Britain. It was incredibly effective. By 1944, more than 7 million women were doing war work in Britain. And women had access to a wider variety of skilled work than in World War I. 75% of the code-breaking workers at Bletchley Park in England were women. This massive influx of new workers led to a growing need for on-the-job training. So they developed a program, Training with an Industry, TWI, to standardize, organize, and have a systematical approach to train people. And that one was a very good program, a very successful program. If you read the Training with an Industry cards, it's, it's a small card which has like 20 bullet points, it still makes a lot of sense nowadays. At the core of training within industry was the concept of the three J's, or job programs. Job instruction, which was instructing people on the best way to do the work. Job methods, 
or the idea that you need to continuously improve, and job relations, which was better communication and leadership. The hardest job of all was learning, but with expert instruction, intricacies of that most complicated of mechanisms, the airplane engine, were readily understood by women. It happened that a woman's delicate touch enabled her even to excel men. Despite the success of the program and of the millions of women who entered the workforce, it had a distinct end date. As men returned from the war, the need for women in factories or programs like TWI dwindled. The social order needed to be restored. Women would have to go back to the home. After the war, the soldiers came back and of course they wanted to have their old jobs back. So the women, which were welders, riveters, grinders, all those kind of technical jobs, were pushed back out of the industry again, back to the kitchen to take care of the kitchen children in church. And the men took the jobs back. And the men were already trained, so there was not much training necessary. Since the war was over, the government pulled back out of industries. Funding for the TWI program was stopped. And, well, I would like to say that the TWI program pretty much died. Women had entered the workforce in huge volumes, performing highly skilled roles usually reserved for men. It was a time of change in ingenuity, born out of the direst need, but a period that would create ripples through our social fabric and through the manufacturing world. It may have taken another two decades, but the role of women in society was altered irrevocably. Even the principles of training within industry would find a second life. Interestingly enough, some of the consultants of TWI who made their money with it, there wasn't much work left in America, some of them went to Japan and taught TWI to the Japanese. And there it fell on very fertile ground. There it was very popular. It became also part of the Toyota production system. And through the form of lean, it eventually came back to America again. It's no longer called TWI, but as lean, it still contains a lot of TWI elements. As manufacturers strive for greater efficiencies on the assembly line, they are turning to TWI and lean manufacturing for their factories. The industrialized wars of the 20th century changed the face of our world, socially, industrially, and politically. For industry, these wars required a level of technological innovation and investment in new ideas on an unmatched scale. They opened up a new world of opportunities for women, who had previously been shut out of many skilled occupations. And the outcome of both wars changed the global political landscape, giving rise to economic superpowers. Superpowers whose economies depended on manufacturing, including weapons production. In January 1961, US President Eisenhower warned of what he saw as one of the greatest threats to democracy. He referred to it as the military-industrial complex. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. At the time, it was the emerging symbiotic relationship of the military establishment and the arms industry that had come about as a result of the Korean War. Now, the U.S. sells nearly $200 billion in weapons a year. Weapons manufacturing makes up around 10% of their $2.2 trillion manufacturing sector. While China outdoes the U.S. for manufacturing, they only own one aircraft carrier to the 10 in operation in the U.S. Public money floods into weapons manufacturing, and it's helping to keep the sector alive. It's a formula that has worked for over half a century, creating a multi-billion dollar global industry of unwavering global influence. <laughs>